I will tell you what I think neoliberalism is, what financialization is, very briefly, and then I will talk to you about crises. And I will present to you what I think is a um, contemporary Marxist view of crisis, a fresher view of crisis, and, um, the type of view that we need today. Maybe not what uh, um, we keep getting from some quarters. I'm not going to speak for, for long on neoliberalism. I'll tell you what I think it is. I think it is, first of all, an ideology. Uh, it's certainly not a period of capitalism. A lot of people talk about it as a period of capitalism, uh, a distinct stage of capitalism. That doesn't, that doesn't wash with me. It's an, it's, it's an ideology, for sure. It's an ideology which, which has an economic dimension, but also a political dimension. It's a mixture of economic and political uh, analysis of sorts. And the basic idea is, of course, the state versus the market, individualism versus the social, and obviously, in this take, um, the market is superior to the state. Neoliberalism doesn't mean, of course, that there is no state. That is a very crude understanding of neoliberalism. It is a certain type of state. And I will have more opportunity to, to, to talk about that type of state that has emerged the last 40 years and is very, very powerful in the advanced countries, but also in the um, developing or um, peripheral countries uh, of the world. It is a kind of state that, of course, serves the market and serves big business. Um, anyway, to go back to the first point, it's an ideology. It's an ideology that proclaims the superiority of the market over the state, of the private, over the social, um, over the public and the, and, the, and the individual, over the social, yeah. It's also policy, though. And as policy it interests me more, it is government policy and applied policy. And as policy, we can see three things, three aspects to it, three characteristic features of it that we find in country after country. First of all, deregulation, and particularly deregulation of labor markets. If it is anything, it is the, the deregulation of the labor market, um, the lifting of controls over labor, over labor in terms of conditions, wages, and so on the kind of stuff that we've lived through in this country, which invented uh, much of that kind of policy, and then we saw it in country after country across the world. Um, second, it is deregulation or liberalization of finance, the financial markets. The other area of deregulation is, of course, finance, the freeing of finance from, from controls, and these controls were over uh, prices of finance, in other words, the interest rates and over quantities of finance. In other words, ability to lend, who lends and where and how. The third element of policy, which is of crucial importance, which is a tax, which is a class, clear tax, a class dimension, of course, is tax cuts. If it is anything, it is the policy uh, that reduces taxes, that aims to cut taxes, and of course, taxes for the rich, uh, and change the balance of the class structure in favor of the rich and against uh, working people and against the rest of society um, in general. These characteristics of policy you will find uh, in this country and in many other developed uh, and uh, uh, peripheral countries too. It follows from these policies that uh, neoliberalism is characterized, not fully marked by, but characterized by austerity, by which we mean um, an attitude towards public spending uh, and ca tax cuts, um, and of course, limited role for fiscal policy. It goes together with uh, advocating a limited role for the state, tax cuts, um, and all the rest in terms of provision and what have you. Most of you would know, obviously, all this stuff. I've just summed it up in terms of what I think uh, it is. Now, neoliberalism then is an ideology and a policy approach that has prevailed and you find it in think tanks, uh, multilateral organizations, governments across the world. It's a policy and ideology that, is clearly, uh, that clearly favors capital against labor, to put it in standard, traditional uh, political economy Marxist terms. There's no doubt at all about it. Okay. It's a shift in the ideological balance and in the policy-making balance against labor, basically, a historic shift. And then we come to financialization. Financialization. <coughs> We've been slower it, to understand what it is. Neoliberalism emerged in the 70s 
and by the 80s people were clear about what was happening, partly because it was an ideology that was expressed clearly. Financialization, we began to grasp the, uh, the dimensions of it later as it became a reality. And that tells you what is different between the two. Financialization is an actual observed reality in practice in terms of how the capitalist economy works and how the capitalist society uh, today uh, functions. Um, a change in the molecular structure of it, the, the, the key interrelationships uh, between capitals and between workers and capital um, that um, has taken place. And in this country, um, it is abundantly obvious, as it is in the United States and elsewhere. Um, so to sum it up very quickly, I won't go into it because I want to talk about crisis. What is it? Well, ascendancy of finance, first and foremost. The shifting of the balance of the capitalist economy in favor of the financial sector, the rise of big, big finance, big banks, financial markets and everything else, um, which you can find in three uh, crucial respects. In terms of what the corporations do, in other words, the productive capital does, um, which has become financialized itself. It tends to get involved in financial transactions. It tends to, it tends to acquire financial functions and capabilities itself, it, big business, not, not banks, but productive business and commercial business enters the financial markets and engages in financial transactions. Uh, very, very prominent in the United States, for instance, where you have a constant uh, channeling of profits from big business to its shareholders via the financial markets. It's a, it's a clear um, dimension of financialization in the United States with implications for investment and so on. That's the first point. Second point, changes in financial institutions which have become more detached from big business because big business is itself financialized and has funds that it plays with. And so banks have become more independent and they transact in markets and they transact with households, with ordinary people, with working people. And third, of course, changes in working people where the life of workers has become more financialized in the sense of depending on finance. Right? We have a, an increase uh, in debt and uh, uh, reliance on finance, private finance for pensions, for insurance, for the ordinary life of workers through which of course profit is extracted by the financial system, it becomes profit of the banks. That much about developed countries, advanced uh, uh, capitalist countries where the process of financialization is fairly clear to see. But of course financialization has also been international. We can think about it as globalized finance. That's another aspect of financialization, the spreading of the tentacles of finance across the globe the last four decades as the core of the capitalist system has become financialized in the big mature uh, concentrations of capital. It's also become uh, globalized. Um, inter international financial markets have emerged which have got a certain degree of independence from the states in which uh, they are based, the city of London being one of the biggest. Um, and as that has happened, what we've observed is the emergence yet again of a kind of core global finance, a subordinate global finance, a reemergence of the division, the, the, the old divisions that we saw, it, we used to talk about in the days of imperialism back in the, 20, in the early 20th century, core and periphery in financial terms, uh, uh, big banks, and big financial institutions of the core countries dictating terms to uh, uh, the smaller countries or the middle income countries and forcing financialization on them, but in a sort of derivative, subordinate way. A kind of re-emergence of financial imperialism, uh, but not in the same way as back in the early 20th century. So that's much about financialization. I haven't got time to, 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 to devote any further to it. I just want to say, a number of crucial aspects of it in order to understand where we are. This period, the last 40 years, is characterized, which I've, discuss, I've discussed as neoliberalism and financialization, is marked by a technological revolution. You know, in the Marxist tradition, you've got to start from <coughs> the forces of production. Okay? So, so the technological revolution is a crucial element of the last 40 years. It's of paramount importance in the historical evolution of capitalism. I'll show you some evidence of it in a minute. Uh, we're talking about essentially IT, AI, you know, all these 
terms, basically the emergence of information technology, telecommunications technology, robotics and so on, which have transformed the technological dimension of um, capitalist production and also capitalist circulation. Without the technological revolution that I just mentioned, financialization would have been impossible. You can't have these global financial markets without the technology that goes uh, with them, that allows them to operate in the way in which they do. The remarkable thing about this period, though, as the world has been transformed technologically, is that investment by these big businesses that have become financialized, by these big banks and so on, has been persistently low. This is a period of low investment, persistently low investment, even in the big, uh, the large, um, mature countries, less so, of course, in the periphery of the uh, global economy. And of course, if you put China in, you've got a different story, right? Because in China, uh, investment is off the scale. But China is a very peculiar, different case, which we can discuss separately, okay? But if you look at the core, the metropolitan areas of, capi of global capitalism, persistent low investment in this country, in the United States, in France, across Europe, even in Germany. Germany, which comes across as the most powerful productive machine in Europe. We have a closer look at its investment and you will see what it is. I'll show you in a minute. Okay? So persistent low investment and as a result, remarkably, despite the technological revolution, weak productivity growth. That's of crucial importance for, to understand the current period of capitalism. We've had massive technological change, but very weak investment and that has gone together with a sustained inability to make the, the productivity of labor rise fast. It rises, it hasn't stopped rising, as is characteristic of capitalism, but compared to previous periods in the history of capitalism, it's not comparable at all. It's not comparable at all. And that is characteristic of the big, of the big countries as well. And in the UK, the last 10 years, the productivity of labor, if you measure it across the economy, it's completely stagnant, okay? That is of crucial importance, of course, because productivity is what makes capitalism tick. The rising of the productivity of labor is what drives profitability, it's what makes the capitalist system work. If the productivity of labor doesn't rise, then we've got problems. We've got stagnation, basically. We've got the roots of stagnation. And at the same time, finally, together with that, persistent pressure on real wages the last 40 years. Persistent pressure, pressure on labor. As this transformation has taken place, labor has been pressurized persistently uh, and real wages have, um, have been, um, they, they have not risen systematically. You can't generalize easily, but you can make that general statement. And if you look at the United States, for instance, real wages right now are pre pretty much at the same level as they were 30 to 40 years ago. It's astonishing. Okay. Um, now this system, the way I've summed it up, it's clear that it has a built-in tendency to stagnation. It has a built-in ten tendency to stagnation. And uh, that tendency to stagnation is relieved by periodic bubbles, financial bubbles, created by this huge expansion of um, finance. Um, there are two problems with bubbles, major problems. The first is that they end up in crisis, more often than not. And this crisis is, of course, goes the jointly and, and sort of often works together with the underlying malfunctioning of production, the problems of production. So they're not just finance. Finance creates the bubble, and together with the malfunctioning of production, you end up with an economic crisis. That's the first problem with bubbles. The second problem with bubbles is, of course, you need them in order to get the stagnating system to grow. You can't have them on order. That's the problem. You can't order a bubble next year. <laughs> and, and, and the mechanisms you put in place in order to get it are precisely the mechanisms that will also probably give you a crisis, as I will point out by what's happening now um, in a few minutes. So this system has produced repeated crises. It's marked by crisis. I mean, nothing, nothing like it since the post-war years, the last 40 years, marked by crisis. And the biggest one is, of course, the crisis of 2007-2009, which was a crisis of financialization par excellence, an astonishing crisis, uh, structural, uh, broke out in finance, affected production, 
uh, disturbed the global uh, economy in a profound way, impacted developing countries, um, and left us in a complete pickle in far as, as far as e economic and social life is concerned in ways that I will explain in a minute. We haven't come out of it in a sense. If, if we have come out of it, but we haven't, we haven't properly come out of it. And I want to, to point out how that is. Um, two social and policy implications of the period, and that's the last thing I'm gonna, I'm gonna say. This period that I've summed up for you, neoliberalism and financialization, requires a couple of things in terms of policy making. The first is inflation control. Inflation is the great bogeyman of this configuration. And it's clear why. Much of it has to do with finance, this transformation. Finance is about lending money, sometimes your own, mostly other people's money. The last thing the lender wants is inflation. The biggest enemy of the lender is inflation. So the financial system, which is, which is inordinately powerful, which affects and influences policy, has made that um, a crucial element of all policy making, control of inflation, because that protects, to a certain extent, um, the lender. And that means an independent central bank that makes sure that this, is, uh, this prevails. And that, as a result, central banks today have emerged as the most powerful public institutions in the world. It's astonishing. Unaccountable, unelected, thoroughly democratic, and the most powerful public institutions. Um, it fits with the transformation of capitalism that I've just uh, pointed out to you. And capable, central banks are, of affecting the performance of the entire economy, as I will again point out in a minute. Why? Fundamentally because this independent central bank is still based, crucially based, on the ability of the state, the modern state, this state which is presumably the enemy of the market and all this, um, to issue money, fiat money. The ability of the state to command money uh, is fu fundamentally the, the last, the foundation of the power of the central bank. Central bank controls the issuing of this money and that gives it the ability to intervene and I will point out how this happens. Last thing, it's a system that hollows our democracy and encourages authoritarianism. There's no doubt at all about it. Um, it hollows our democracy because the dominance of uh, the economy by the financial system, the need to control inflation, the need to shift policy onto the central bank and allow the central bank to make economic policy means what? It means that economic policy has become the preserve of so-called specialists, unelected people, who reside in uh, key institutions with enormous power, who presumably have the know-how and the skill, the skill and the training to make policy, and elections are not supposed to influence that. So you can have whatever economic policy you like as a, as, a, as a political party. You can come from the right, you can come from the left, you can argue different policies. When you actually enter government, these nice gentlemen and gentlewomen will, arrive, will appear in front of you and will tell you, no, no, the economy requires that you do this, right? And politicians usually comply, have so far complied with that. In other words, they have hollowed out democracy. What's the point of voting? What's the point of having a democratic process if in the end of the day, um, policy is dictated by people who've got degrees from the London School of Economics or from Harvard? Because that's basically what this says. Okay? So as less so. Um, <laughs> um, so, the outcome is, of course, authoritarianism as well. Now, no more time, I want to tell you about the crisis and show you some evidence. What has been the response of this system to the crisis of 2007-2009? Now, I stress that crisis was, was, was an extraordinary crisis. It began in the U.S. financial system, and it began because U.S. corporations, big, huge banks, had lent enormous amounts of money to the poorest section of the U.S. working class. Black people, Latinos and others, uh, residing in the poorest areas of the uh, urban concentrations, the conurbations of the United States, had become receivers of this kind of uh, credit. The credit was then securitized, uh, sold onto big markets, and it spread across other markets, and in a sense created uh, risk for the system as a whole. And in the end it burst out as interest rates began to go up. 
and people find themselves unable to pay for the, for the credit they'd received to house him. That type of crisis would have been unimaginable to Karl Marx. It's no question. It's unimaginable, unimaginable to anyone writing about the 19th century and 19th century capitalism that a, that a global crisis could burst out because the poorest section of the US working class had become indebted, uh, extraordinarily indebted. I mean, it's just that was a financialization crisis if there ever was one. What was the response to it? Well, the response to it by the governments of the United States, Europe, and elsewhere was actually quite uniform. The first step was austerity. Yeah. Actually, not the first step, but the first structural step was austerity. Austerity meaning shift the cost onto uh, working people by reducing public expenditure and increasing pressure on wages. Um, whatever else you do, it's the standard re reflex action of governments in the financialization period. You need austerity, it's good for you. It cures all sorts of ills and, and, and diseases. So austerity was adopted and applied with tremendous costs, tremendous social costs for working people. Wage restraint was the second one, which I've already mentioned. As I say, reflex actions. And then, crucially, central bank intervention. The problem had begun in the financial system and then spread to the rest of the economy with unemployment and so on, impacting uh, developing countries too. Uh, central bank intervention was paramount in order to stabilize the system. How did they intervene? They intervened in two extraordinary ways and the, the aftermath of that intervention is still very much with us. That's what we're living through. The first thing they did is to drive interest rates down to zero and even to negative levels. Now, I don't know how to, I don't know how to make that, the, 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 the extraordinary dimension, of that. I don't know how to convey, to, to, to put it across. There hasn't been a period like that in the history of capitalism. Nothing like it. Of interest rates for 10 years being either very close to zero or just below it. And actually showing no signs of going above it. You understand what negative interest rates mean? It means that you're actually, you're actually lending money to someone and you're paying to lend money to them. <laughs> it just goes against any kind of analytics that uh, uh, we use in political economy. How did they do that? The central banks did that. They did that by intervening in the, in the big financial markets, creating money because they control fiat money, as I indicated before. They created enormous amounts of money, uh, which they made available to banks, to private banks. And by making them available to private banks, drove short-term interest rates down and then gradually long-term interest rates down. And interest rates have come down to very, very low um, levels. They did that and obviously initially that was very beneficial for banks because it made the cost of money very cheap for them. Very, they, made, they made money very easily available to them. Then banks could, re could respond to the crisis situation. Okay. The other thing they did was to provide liquidity to the banks, which went with the zero interest rates. In other words, they made cash available to them, but not only to banks, also to states. So what central banks have done in the last 10 years is to buy public assets, financial assets, bonds, to an unprecedented extent. I mean, the extent to which the big states, I'll show you the evidence in a minute, are indebted right now to central banks is incredible. States have been issuing bonds. The central banks have been buying huge amounts of these bonds, creating money as they do that. Uh, and private banks have also bought bonds too. Everybody's been buying state bonds. Um, the, 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 the financial sector that has been um, expanding has been the public bond area. In other words, the state has become enormously indebted. The last 10 years have been years of phenomenal indebtedness of the major states um, of the world. Um, the last point is no structural change. They did all that without changing any of the structure of financialization that I mentioned to you before. And they did it consciously. There was a discussion back in 2007, 2009. Should we intervene structurally? Should we change something about how the system works? Should we do something about permanent austerity? Should we do something about finance? Should we restrict finance and, 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 and encourage other areas of the economy? In practice, they've done nothing structural. The system has remained the same, except that they've done these changes at the center of it. The result. 
has been extraordinary again. The last 10 years have seen, we've come off the peak of financialization. The growth of the financial system the last 10 years is nothing like what it was before. Okay? So peak financialization seems to be over, and neoliberalism is clearly failing the last 10 years. Uh, there, there's no doubt at all about it, right? So it is a historic, a period of historic importance, and it is the outcome of the great crisis in this way that I've summed up for you. Uh, peak financialization, as I say, probably over, most probably over, and uh, neoliberalism is failing. Why and how? During those 10 years, these interventions have failed to make accumulation go any faster. Nothing structural has changed. Accumulation remains fundamentally weak, productive accumulation. The core of productive accumulation remains fundamentally weak. I'll show you some evidence in a minute. Second, financial profits have become stagnant, unlike the period before. The period before, just before the great crisis, financial profits were enormous. Um, not so the last 10 years. Banks are not making profits the way they used to. Actually, they're under strain. The whole of the financial system is under strain. Third, household debt is not increasing. Household debt is actually de decreasing proportionately. I'm not, people are heav heavily indebted, of course, but not compared to what they were previously. They're proportionately less indebted than before. People have been burned, basically, and they are trying to limit the extent to which they're indebted. They're not succeeding as much as I would like that to, to, to be the case, but nonetheless, it's uh, clearly uh, observable. Finally, enormous state indebtedness and increasing now corporate indebtedness in the United States. Large non-financial uh, businesses are, in, uh, are again borrowing heavily. The outcome is entirely dysfunctional finance again, and there are signs of crisis emerging, and I want to tell you what they are. They've just begun to emerge in the last um, few weeks. But let me show you a little bit of evidence. So you don't think I'm making this up as I'm going along. <coughs> These are financial profits as a proportion of total profits. Um, we've done this measurement. It's not a common measurement you will see. Um, in fact, you won't see it because we are among the very few who've done it. So, so this compares basically the profits made by banks relative to the total profits made by the capitalist um, sector uh, per year. That's from the uh, end of from the 1950s to the middle of the 2010s, okay? And what you can see is that financial profits in the um, 2000s reached an extraordinary proportion, early 2000s, an extraordinary proportion of total profits. Nothing like that has happened before. That's the, that, that was going towards the great crisis. The crisis occurs around, the, around here. Financial profit collapses, and it collapses because of Finance was hit very hard. It collapses as proportion of total profit. Total profit also falls. I will show you that in a minute. And then it bounces back, but it cannot rise. It is it's, it's flatlining, basically. And it's what I said to you before. Peak financialization seems to be behind us. Okay, the system is financialized, for sure, but it's not growing uh, with any vigor. Let me show you profit rates, and you will see uh, a little bit more detail. Uh, You'll see that in a little bit more detail. The red line is basically the average rate of profit. It's what Marxist economists like to calculate. It's the average rate of profit for the US economy, estimated in the way of Dumenil, Dumenil and Levy. It doesn't matter how you estimate, to be honest. The, the basic point is the same. And you can see it, it's from the late 40s to the middle of the 2010s now. It's a long uh, measurement. You will see that the rate of profit kind of peaks in the early 60s, as people have <coughs> measured many times. And then it declines until the early 80s. Um, and then it rises and bumps along. So it's flat lines, more or less, with, with ups and downs um, in this period. Okay? What's interesting is to compare it to the rate of profit of banks. And that's something we've done, which hasn't been <coughs> done very much before. We've estimated the rate of profit of the banks and compared it to the average rate of profit. And you will see that the rate of profit of banks during this period, these 20 years of peak financialization <coughs> just before the crisis was extraordinary, above the rate of profit of the economy as a whole. But then it collapses, and it doesn't rise above the average rate of profit. There's been a rebalancing. Profit rates are flatlining, and banking profits are even worse on average. That doesn't mean that every bank is like that, obviously. Okay? 
Um, so this period has been marked by this peculiar, not peculiar, this strong uh, feature uh, the last 10 years. It's also been a period, as I said, of falling investment. This is in Europe, but I could have shown you the same thing for the United States. This is France, Germany, Greece, Italy, and Spain. It's almost uniform. This is investment uh, from 2001 to 2015, and I could have continued to 2019, the same thing. This is a period of low investment. Um, big business doesn't invest, and you can see it all around you. The, the infrastructure of Europe and the productive uh, capacity of Europe is actually falling behind because investment is so weak um, during those 10 years. And as a result, real productivity per person, the same countries in Europe, look at what it does. That's the rate of growth of it. It goes close to zero the last 10 years. It's the, it's the absence of productivity growth that I mentioned. You, and it holds for Germany, too. You mustn't think that Germany is any different. People imagine that there's some kind of industrial miracle in Germany. German capitalism is not like that. Okay. One last thing, piece of evidence. Um, debt. This is debt in the United States. The mountain of debt of financialization. Debt peaks in 2000 and eight, just at the time of the crisis. This is household debt, this is productive enterprise debt, and that's state debt, the red thing up there. And you can see what happens afterwards. Debt flatlines doesn't increase in total, certainly for a period, because household debt declines. American households, or working people and others have tried to restrain the, the extent to which they're indebted. Big business for a period did not increase its borrowing. After that, actually, it increases it quite a bit. I haven't shown you the, but it doesn't change it dramatically. And the real player is the state. The state bumps up all the slack. In other words, enormous indebtedness on, on the part of the state. That's what this shows. The United States today, the government, uh, is more indebted than at any time since the Second World War. If you look at what, the, what its uh, um, books look like, it's, more, it's like it's fought a war, except he hasn't. The only war he's fighting is to keep the system ticking over. Um, and that creation of debt has gone with the acquisition of the debt by the central bank, which creates money and makes the money available to central banks. It's, the, it's, it's weird, it's a bizarre merry-go-round. The state issues debt, the central bank buys the debt, it creates uh, money to do that, and banks and others can continue to operate, the system survives and stagnates while it does that. One last thing, while this has been happening in the developed world, in the mature countries the last 10 years, in the peripheral countries where subordinate financialization can be observed in Mexico, in Turkey, in Argentina to a certain extent the last few years, in uh, India to a certain extent, um, in South Africa, what you got there is a continuation of financialization. Uh, financialization continued to expand, subordinate financialization continued to expand. Capital flows, global capital flows increased again after the crisis towards these countries. Um, the financial systems began to expand, especially the middle income countries. And what happened there is that their big businesses increased their debt, um, private debt. So if you look at Turkish uh, the Turkish capitalist sector now, the productive sector, the big businesses are enormously indebted. They're indebted in dollars to a large extent because they borrowed abroad because of this financialization, global, global financialization that I mentioned. They're indebted in dollars. They operate in Turkish lira. There is a huge risk as a result because when the Turkish lira falls, they are in an incredibly difficult corner. Okay? Uh, and that instability that danger, that risk, you find in several developing countries. And that's the biggest risk at the moment of a new crisis in the uh, peripheral countries. That's where, that's where the weakness is from the capitalist sector that is engaged in this continuing financialization through the private sector and taking advantage of the global flows. Um, I'll stop here, right? I'll say this and I'll, I'll stop here. Um, yeah. In 
the advanced countries, though, the parameters of crisis are different, or at least have different determinants to a certain extent. That much, just you know, by the developing countries or the, the, the peripheral countries. In the advanced countries, by that I mean United States, this country, um, France to a certain extent, Germany, although there, again, you have differences because of the euro and so on, which we can discuss, but the characterization holds generally. What you get is this. Again, it's a unique, unique phenomenon in the history of capitalism. Zero interest rates for several years have impacted across the economy. You see, interest rates are a key price in the capitalist system. They're a fundamental price. Uh, it's the price that basically balances the financial sphere with the non-financial sphere. It's an important price for, for a capitalist economy. When you drive it to zero, you're going to get negative peculiar results. And these we can see. Zero interest rates then. First of all, they have impacted negatively on the money markets. What are the money markets? The money markets are the markets in which banks trade with each other. It's a key market, right? It's a key market in the financial system. When you have zero interest rates, <coughs> that happens because the state creates assets, like I mentioned to you before, and the banks acquire them through the central bank. The banks now, across the world, have got enormous amounts of money deposited with the central bank. That's how it's worked. The central bank lends the money to them and they've got the money deposited with the central bank. They've got enormous amounts of money deposited with the central bank and they don't lend that money in the money markets, in the interbank markets. They're sitting on that money and they're not lending, uh, lending it to each other because they know they can get more money from the state or from the central bank in the next period. That has completely disrupted the functioning of the money markets. In September, there was an incredible occurrence in the US money markets. I don't know if you follow it at all. Interest rates for a day shot up to 10%. Uh, they shot up to 10% and the Federal Reserve had to intervene quickly in order to stop uh, uh, a blockage from, from, from emerging. And then it did it again uh, three or four times uh, subsequently or, or different, uh, with different levels of money. That's a sign of the malfunctioning of the, of the money markets whereby the banks are not lending to money to each other. Um, the system, in other words, is, is heading towards logjam. They don't know what to do about it, right? It's heading towards logjam, uh, as is manifest by that. So dysfunctional money markets are evident. Something is happening. Some, we don't know exactly what is the, the path through which this is occurring, but something is definitely happening there. Uh, right now, the money markets are not functioning um, at all, as they should be. Um, th these are the first intimations of crisis beginning to emerge in the financial system again. Second point, zero interest rates have impacted on bank profits, of course. How do banks make a profit? They take one person's money and give it to another person. And they make a profit through the spread. They borrow. Um, in other words, they pay interest to, the, to, the, to their depositors and they charge interest to the uh, to their clients. But when you drive interest rates down to zero, the spread at which the banks do that disappears. You understand? Uh, because you still have to pay something to the depositors. Other interest, become neg uh, interest rates become negative, then the profit of the banks begins to, uh, begins to disappear. So banks are under uh, increasing strain uh, uh, across the world as a result of that. And of course, other financial institutions, pension funds, insurance corporations, when interest rates are down to zero, they cannot operate because they rely on returns being generated in financial markets in order to be able to pay the pensions and cover the insurance um, and so on. The system, in other words, is malfunctioning as a result of that. Um, that has gone with the tremendous expansion of the balance sheet of central banks. I want to give you a sense of what I mean by that, uh, just to give you a sense of the magnitude. The three central banks, the biggest central banks of the world right now, in other words, the, the, the ECB, the European Central Bank, the Japanese Central Bank, and the, um, the Fed, the Federal Reserve. Between them, the balance sheet, in other words, their assets, are above $13 trillion. Do you understand? I mean, that, that, that is a gigantic amount of money. Um, it, it's, uh, 
And to me, I mean, I, I get scared by, by looking at it. I mean, <laughs> but, but that's because I look at numbers. Nothing like that has happened before. These are huge, huge amounts of money that the central banks have made available. Clearly, they know they've got to reverse it, but they don't know how to do it because if they begin to reverse it, we we'll go back to the first point that I mentioned, which is that the money markets don't function properly. Do you understand? The banks don't lend to each other. So it's neither forward nor back that they can go. They're stuck. It, it, it's an incredible thing to, 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 to observe. Uh, and last but not least, as that has been happening because they made so much money available, the system might be stagnating as a whole. The financial, the financial sector might not be growing very fast, but there are bubble phenomena emerging in various pockets across the economy because money is so cheap. So um, the bond markets across the world for major bonds are definitely, a, it's a definite bubble there. Uh, the price of bonds is ridiculous. To a certain extent it's logical because they drove interest rates to negative levels. And just to give you a sense, Greece two days ago borrowed in the open markets at negative rates of interest. You understand Greece, which is a basket case. I mean, the, we, the, with a the destroyed economy, um, it was able to borrow in the global markets at negative rates of interest. In other words, people are paying the Greeks to lend to them. Do uh, you, you grasp that? I mean, so, um, so it, it, there are bubble phenomena in s some of these markets, but at the moment they're still quite localized. It's not, a, it's, not a, it's not a bubble in the same way that it was in 2006, 2007 but there are intimations of crisis emerging every, everywhere along the lines that I pointed out to you. Something will give. The question is how uh, and when. The key thing they've got in the, I, 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 the capital has got in its uh, favor is of course the ability to keep interest rates still low. Crises usually require interest rates to begin to go up to catalyze the, the change, to catalyze the, the, the outbreak of the crisis. For the moment, the interest rates are still low and they, they, they look as if they're going to keep them low. Even Trump has pushed the Federal Reserve to begin to lower interest rates again. So that will attenuate the pressures, but the pressures are obvious. They're obvious. They, they're obvious and that the, the outcome of 10 years of dealing with the aftermath of that crisis in that particular way that I pointed out to you. Now, what do we do? I'm not going to go into what we do, but obviously it is for us to propose right now an alternative to all this. It is to, for us to propose a, uh, a socialist response. I would have discussed that with you, but I've already spoken for far too long, so, so I prefer to do it in discussion. Uh, that has to involve both changes in the uh, productive economy, the relation between uh, capital and labor, uh, radical uh, breakthrough uh, there, and also changes in the financial sector and changes in, the, in politics. But that um, we can discuss um, I've, I've talked enough, we can discuss now uh, and explore further uh, some of these points that I've made. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Costas, for really outlining the negation of the negation. Really. In what way? <laughs> anyway, um, first of all, let's just take direct questions. Um, I'm putting the rest, we'll take a few questions at the time and then open up to yeah, my question is, uh, why, are firms, why are firms not investing? Well, one way of saying that is, well, if you have over-accumulation, accumulation is a thing of accumulation, then, well, they 